All right, today we're going to talk about a strategy for solving SN1 and SN2 problems. We went over in class on Wednesday just the general idea of SN1 and SN2 problems, uh, but I want to spend a little time talking about strategies for solving these problems like you're working on for the daily problems uh, and like you'll have for practice problems in the book. So when you are first starting these problems, the first thing you want to do is look at the electrophile. And the question to ask is, is the Rx primary, secondary, or tertiary? That will tell you what reactions are possible. It's a primary Rx. Only SN2 is possible. It's a tertiary Rx. SN1 is possible. And we talked about the reasons for this in class. If it's a secondary Rx, it can be either SN1 or SN2. And then you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper. Right? But even if it's primary or tertiary, it doesn't tell you that you're definitely going to get SN2 and you're definitely going to get SN1. You have to see what the nucleophile is. All right? So the second step is look at the nucleophile. The question you ask there is, is the nucleophile strong or weak? If it's strong, which usually means that it's charged, right, negatively charged, that's going to favor SN2. If it's weak, generally meaning that it's neutral, that's going to favor SN1. Right? So for example, if you have a secondary substrate and a weak nucleophile, you'll get SN1 as the product or as the reaction. If it's secondary, a strong nucleophile, you're going to get SN2. And again, as we said in class, this is an oversimplification uh, because we also have to worry about elimination, but we'll start talking about that next week. Okay. The final thing you look at is the solvent. And when we look at the solvent, we have three different options for solvents. Right? We can have a nonpolar solvent, nonpolar solvent thing hexanes. Right? We're never going to use nonpolar solvents for these substitution reactions. They don't dissolve both the nucleophile and the electrophile. All right, so these are not used. All right, the type of solvents we're going to use are polar protic and polar aprotic. All right, and I want you to look up examples of these so we can talk about them in class on Friday. All right, but polar protic solvents, all right, these are very, very common and are used for both SN1 and SN2. However, the key point is that SN1 reactions require polar protic solvents. Without polar protic solvents, you do not get SN1 reactions. So they're used for both SN1 and SN2, but they are required for SN1. And a good question for you to think about is why is it absolutely necessary that we have those for SN1 reactions? Right? Polar aprotic, these are uh, used for SN2, right? and they actually enable you to run the reactions faster and you often get higher yields if you use these polar aprotic solvents. So they're used for SN2 and they're better than polar protic. And again, it's useful for you to think about why that is, and we can talk about that in class on Friday. Um, and then the final thing is just stereochemistry. All right. Just don't forget to worry about stereochemistry when you're writing out the structure of the products. Right? So the key here is just to take this into account. Why 
when x is attached to a chiral carbon. Right? And again, just to review what we talked about on Wednesday, right, for SN2, we are always going to get inversion. And for SN1, we're going to get racemization, which is both inversion and retention. Okay. So let's just end by doing uh, two examples just to highlight this strategy. Okay. So example number one. All right, so here's an example uh, where we have, look at the Rx, tertiary Rx favors SN1, right? You'll note that we only have one reagent under the arrow, so this is both our nucleophile and the solvent, and this is very common for SN1 reactions where the solvent and the nucleophile are the same molecule. So nucleophile and solvent, it happens to be a polar protic solvent and a weak nucleophile. All right, so everything here is pointing to SN1. Tertiary favors SN1, polar protic and weak nucleophile, these things both favor SN1. So this has to be an SN1 reaction. All right, once we identify that, we could write out the mechanism. I'll let you write out the mechanism on your own. Uh, but just to be clear, the product we're going to get is that ether. Okay. And let's do one more. And in this case, we'll go through our strategy again. All right. So we look here. This is a secondary alkyl halide, so it can be either SN1 or SN2. We look to the nucleophile, right, so our nucleophile right here is sodium cyanide. Again, don't forget this is Na plus and CN minus. CN minus is the nucleophile. It's negatively charged. This is a strong nucleophile, so that's going to favor SN2. We look down at the solvent, DMSO. If you don't know what the structure that corresponds to that is, you should take a look at that in the book. Uh, but this is a polar aprotic. All right, so that's also going to favor SN2. All right, so we note that this can be either SN1 or SN2. Strong nucleophile, polar aprotic solvent. This must be an SN2 reaction. Right. You'll also note that this is a chiral center, and it's drawn a little bit differently than we've been drawing things in class. So I'm actually going to ask you to figure out what's the structure of that product, uh, and we can talk about this problem in class on Friday. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, good luck with your problems, and we'll see you in class on Friday.